My name is Sami Laiho. This session is called Windows 8 Troubleshooting or Black Belt Troubleshooting. I actually spoke to Mark Minassi last year about not getting into TechEd. I've been trying to get into TechEd with my sessions for about five or six years now. And uh, he told me that he's been to my sessions and he knows that they're really good, but you really suck at your subject or topic names, that they're really boring. So if you want to get in, you have to have Black Belt, Ninja, Kung Fu, or what's the other one? Cracking in it. So now, now I've been touring the world this year, getting into every single conference I've been trying to. I have sessions called Seven Ways to Crack Windows 7 and this Black Belt one. So it seems to work. And if you see in the next one after me is becoming an office ninja in 60 minutes. So seems to do the trick. Thank you, everyone, for coming here. This is my first time in Australia. And I actually took a website up here. I don't know. You'll hear why. Um, First of all, a small raise of hand. Is, is there anyone here who does speaking for a profession in any way? Not that much speakers here. A few, OK. Um, tricks of the trade. I've been speaking for about 15 years. It's about half of my life that I've been doing this. Um, yesterday, I was uh, at 6 o'clock in the morning. I woke up at the hotel with about 40 degrees uh, fever and uh, had no voice. I can do it with the fever because you can just take Panadol, Ibuprofen, and adrenal adrenaline will do the rest. That works. But if you don't have any voice, that's really hard. Luckily, I'm in Australia because I found out that you've got lots of snakes here. And actually, the best way to get your voice back instantly is to get an anti-venom for viper bites. That works really well. And it did the trick. You can... You can at least hear me yesterday, I couldn't make a voice. But I'm still sick, as you can probably hear, so we'll hope that it'll go through this 75 minutes. First of all, a little bit about myself. As I said, my name is Sami Laiho. It's been especially fun for me to be here for the last two days, because Finland used to have a big company called Nokia. So <laughs> I used to bring stuff wherever I go. I used to bring these phones with me. Cool Finnish phones, Nokia. Uh, everyone was, everyone's been talking about now it should be called Micro Kia, which sounds like a really small Korean car, if you ask me. <laughs> In Finland, we are talking about that we hope it'll be called Mokia. <laughs> I'll just tell you why, because Mokia in Finnish means exactly lots of failures. <laughs> so perhaps the micro Kia will be better anyway. But now, now I'm not going to talk about these Microsoft phones nowadays. Luckily, this time I came here with authentic Finnish Angry Birds candy. <laughs> it's a lot better. I actually, this cost about three euros in Finland, and I just exchanged it to Mark Rusinovich's uh, novel. That's about 30 euros, better than bitcoins. I have something for you also, but let's talk about that a little later on. Um, I work for my own company called adminize.com. We'll do, we do software for getting rid of admin rights in companies. And I'm also a speaker, and I'll do that with a company called Sovelto, which is a Finnish company. If you don't follow me on Twitter, please do. That's Sami Laiho. I've been doing deep dives to Windows OS. I've been teaching operating system troubleshooting for about 14 years now, since 1999. That's actually the first and probably only Windows XP troubleshooting course which was done in the Atlantic Ocean. I'm also a professional scuba diving instructor, so I had to combine these a bit. Um, students were fine, but Lenovo or IBM at that time didn't make it, but that was fun. Uh, probably one of the reasons I got here is uh, I've been touring the world with a free software called Vioski. 
In Polish, it means a village. I had no idea about that one, but it doesn't have anything to do with the village. Uh, it's a free replacement for steady state. If you've been doing steady state with Windows XP and Vista, you know that Windows 7, at the Windows 7 time frame, they got rid of steady state. So I did it for free. Um, just as a small commercial, as I don't get any money out of Vioski, uh, if you do Windows 8 refresh or replace, with, uh, which takes like five minutes to 15 minutes to complete, this will reboot your machine in exactly the same image that it had in the morning, and it takes 25 seconds. That's about it. Just so you can give me a little slack, you can probably hear that English is not my native language, not even close. So you just, if I'm trying to translate my jokes into English, you have to give me some slack. Because just so you know that where I'm coming from, when you get administrator, we get this. <laughs> try, log, try logging in on a server with that one. <laughs> when you get gpedit.msc, in the UI we get this. It's easy for me. I, I always say that it's really easy because we learned it at like three years old. But uh, that's Ryhmäkäytäntö Objekti Editori, which is a common troubleshooting tool in the Finnish UI. <laughs> Everyone here knows Lord of the Rings. J.R.R. Tolkien wrote the language of the elves based on the Finnish language because it was the only language he could find that no one else would understand. So. And that's actually true, it's not a joke. The language of the elves is based on Finnish. So I always talk about Lord of the Rings because it's really close to my heart. We're going to have a party tonight. Everyone knows the small creature in Lord of the Rings, Gollum. Today you have the party. Tomorrow morning you don't want to get yourself a Gollum hangover. You know what that is? That's when you wake up gray and naked behind a rock and you've lost the ring. <laughs> so what are we going to go through today? I'm not going to tell you 10 things that are broken in Windows OS and how to troubleshoot those, because that's not troubleshooting. That's just doing something that someone else has already done, done the digging for. So I'm going to go through, hopefully, stuff that makes the Topic, black belt, have a ring to it as um, we'll go through some stuff in the OS that everyone who does troubleshooting, even if it's Windows XP or even if it's Windows 8.1, the stuff should, most of it should be common to all OSs. I was really amazed about it. Perhaps you saw it yesterday as I tweeted, tweeted it that Windows 1.0 actually had support until 2001. It's like crazy. Think about the guys who are like doing the troubleshooting. Someone calls you. I'm running this Windows 1.0 here. Wow. 16 years of support. That's more than XP. As everyone is saying that XP has the longest one ever, but it's not. So, sorry. Uh, first of all, a few baselines. And before we go here, uh, some housekeeping. After the session, we're going to have lunch. So I'm not in a hurry to get out of here if I'm still standing. So after the session, you can come here and ask questions if you wish. I do lots of teaching around the world. So if you want to have my greeting cards, you can have those also, business cards. And of course, I've got the coolest Järjestelmä Valvoja t-shirt. <laughs> this should be something that no one else has. I only got about 20 of those, and my rock star moment in TechEd North America was the time when I had given out the 20, and as, I, as a joke, I told that, I'm really sorry, guys, but I only have this, this sweaty T-shirt that I've been wearing for the whole week, so, and a Korean guy, I want it, I want it, I want it, I want it, I want it. <laughs> it was like, they called my wife, like, this was my rock star moment, I had to give my sweaty T-shirt to a Korean guy. OK, so first of all, a few baselines. I've always been teaching troubleshooting and starting with a few phrases of the, like having no logic. The only logic in Windows OS is that there is no logic. Other OSs might have some kind of a logic into it, but I'd say Windows doesn't. This is being videoed, I know. 
and I'm still getting in to these conferences. So hopefully the next few examples won't hurt anyone. Uh, of course, if we start with the basic system partition has all the boot files and boot partition has all the system files. That's logical. It's been in Windows since the beginning and it's been there for so long so you can't change it now. In a Windows six, in a 64 bit window, system 32 has all the 64 bit code and SysBob64 has all the 32 bit code. That's again logical. <laughs> There's um, I was actually troubleshooting an SMP protocol error trying to figure out where to inject the correct parameters in the registry. And I was trying to find the browser service. And I read it on the internet many times, put the parameters for the browser service, just couldn't get it work. It took me almost half a day to figure out that Dave Cutler, the guy who did the kernel, just misspelled it. It's Bowser. It's not browser. <laughs> He's missing an R. I thought Bowser was, the, was Mario's and Luigi's biggest enemy in Mario Brothers, but anyway. So if you're looking for a file browser, it's Bowser. If you saw my title, by the way, that senior technical fellow. Dave Cutler is also a senior technical fellow at Microsoft. It's good to have your own company because I'm competing with Mark Rusinovich a lot. And Mark is a technical fellow in Microsoft. As soon as I established my own company, I could pick up my own title, just make it up. So I'm a senior technical fellow. <laughs> I, actually, Dave Cutler is a senior technical fellow as well. Um, there's a really important network driver in Windows called AFD. If you look in the registry, there will be a hive called the, or a key called the AFD. What does that stand for? For the last four or five years, there's been a note next to it saying something like Ox auxiliary functioning driver, doesn't say anything. Actually, it's AFD because the guys who were doing the network stack were late, and Dave Cutler yelled at them, that why can't you just make the driver work? And they said that the driver is working fine, but we just can't make a name for it. So Dave Cutler yelled out loud, it's just another freaking driver, and wrote it in. And you, I, I'll tell you, it's not freaking, but an F word that I'm not allowed to say here. Do you know why hives are hives? When you go to the registry editor, registry editor and open up a hive or unload a hive, it's hive because the guy who was responsible for this technology in the registry was scared of bees. And Dave Cutler thought that the guy was trying to stay away from his projects as much as away from beehives. So he called them hives. So that just tells a story about that you can't do Windows troubleshooting in a technical way, thinking that there might be a logic into it. You just have to remember that it's done by people, and they might have different state of minds, let's say. Tools that you always need for troubleshooting. First of all, sysinternal tools. Uh, yesterday there was a session. Someone was telling about Zoomit, a sysinternal tool, talking about like how cool is it. Use Zoom it, it's just presentations. And I told them that I was present in Amsterdam when Mark Rusinovich wrote the tool. And that was the day that I actually really understood how good he is. We were having a session with 40 people paying, I think, about 2,500 euros to get there, a five day session run by Mark Rusinovich and David Solomon. That was before he joined Microsoft, Mark. And um, he was showing stuff up, zooming in, using an InFocus tool, uh, InFocus projectors, the InFocus company. They had a tool like that to draw lines and zoom. He was using that. He had been using it for years. And suddenly one of us, one of the 40, 39 who thought he was the coolest guy in the world, with this one dude who actually stood up and said, Excuse me, Mr. M Mr. Rusinovich, I think that you are not allowed to use that one because you are not running an in-focus projector while presenting. And Mark Rusinovich was like, okay. And everyone else was like, <laughs> So he went back to the hotel, came up the next day, showed Zoomit and told he had just written the code himself. So I hope no one is objecting anymore. <laughs> 
If I could solve things like that. Oh, I can't do it. Let's go back home. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Crazy. You need system journal tools. You need debugging tools. Debugging tools sounds like going to WinDBG or something like that. No, you are not doing debugging usually with the debugger itself, but you need the DLLs to support system journal tools like Process Explorer. Usually you don't need the debugging tools themselves, but you just need to have them in the background. And Network Monitor, although it has a following tool nowadays called something else, and I can't remember what it is, but the new version of Network Monitor is not Network Monitor anymore. But First of all, what I do always when I start is that I show something that I would hope all your customers were, that it was mandatory for them to go to a course where they teach you how to get good error descriptions. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about trying to get something between these two examples. Someone telling you my computer just broke. That's what you usually hear. And I don't know if I should be laughing or crying, but this one is an actual screenshot of one of my customers giving me an error code. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, dedication. that's dedication, I agree. I didn't know what to say. I said thank you, but. <laughs> As you can see, probably it's NT4 time frame because all of the hexacode here, they don't have it in, they don't have it in the later ones, so. But that's dedication, yeah. So to get something in between, let's go through a few demos. Here you have a Windows 8 machine. First of all, some of them tell you that um, they got error number something, as they think that you would know all of these by heart. Let's take the command prompt and just change it to something that you can see. Got a new VM, should have done this beforehand, but let's do it here. Screen text. If you do really black belt troubleshooting, that's, it, that's actually called the ninja mode. <laughs> that's when you have black on black. <laughs> but uh, I think this one will be better. So NetHelp MSG, a really, really old tool which translates the error codes to text. Usually when I do this in a hands-on lab, someone is telling me, excuse me, instructor, this is not working. I'm getting an error which says the installation source for this blah, blah. <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> you should. <laughs> There's about 32,000 of these, and you sh shouldn't have to remember these by heart. They just think that you know them. So people think that I'm doing my best as I even wrote him the error code. Not the text, but the error code. So they think it's better than not telling you enough details. After today's sessions, we are going to have a party. So when you guys are going to the, all you married people who are going to the, going to the party, you have to remember one of these, that's NetHelp MSG4006, which says that replication with a non-configured partner is not allowed. <laughs> That's all. Um, if that's not enough, then what people should remember is that when you have a dialog, let's see, and you get an error message, you just press Control C, shoot up your email program, and press Control V. So all the dialogs have a copy paste functionality in it nowadays. Uh, although, I don't know why, it's sad that they don't have a small button next to it saying copy to clipboard, so people would know how to use it, but anyway, makes it a bit easier. If that's not enough, then you can go for snipping tool. The next one, snipping tool probably you know, came in Windows 7 for the first time. Get something, draw your comments, and then just hit send snip. You can even do 
um, menus. I thought I couldn't, but a student of mine, I, I had a hands-on lab, and I actually said that snipping tool is quite good for everything else, but the opened up menus. You can't have an open menu and take a snip. And a student of mine asked me, like, have you read the help file? <laughs> Come on, I wouldn't be teaching black belt troubleshooting if I was reading help files. <laughs> no one would believe me. You can actually do it, yes. So if you take a new snip and then uh, press escape, open up the menu that you have, and then press control print screen, which will wake up the snipping tool again. It says it in the help file, by the way. <laughs> if that's not good enough and you have new Windows 8 stuff on here, start screen, I'm trying to keep this story short, but I have to tell you this one. In Tech at Europe, Tech at North America, speakers have a, if I have a 75 minute slot, I also have to do 20 hours of booth duty. Every speaker is supposed to be 20 hours on a booth in the expo area. And in Australia, they don't have it. So if I, was, if I hadn't been sick for the whole day yesterday, I actually could have gone to sessions myself, and that's really cool. In Tech and North America, what I was really amazed of was that if even with Windows 8 has been around for a year, still at the, there was a device bar with all new Windows 8 machines. And they had Windows 8 RT on a Surface. I mean, Windows, Surface RT with Windows 8. And uh, I was really amazed that I had, every single day I had tens and tens of people coming to me and ask and tell me that they are really amazed that Windows 8 RT actually has this Windows 7 emulator in it. <laughs> and I was like, has Microsoft actually been so good at marketing Windows 8 that there are people who think that you have two different operating systems running Windows 8 and a Windows 7 emulator on it? even though the kernel is like 98% the same as Windows 7 and you only have a new start screen on it. But it's getting people really, really mixed up. But if you're doing stuff with the new start screen, then there's Windows print screen, which will just quickly flick and then you have it in the clipboard. Uh, if that's not enough, then the last resort would be PSR. So PSR was already built into Vista, but it's, a, oh, I'm sorry, in Windows 7, but it's a lot better now. So you can just record what you were doing. So it'll just record every step that you take. You can even do comments, like here. Where is ninja mode? When you've done, stop record, email, and that's it. You get a storyboard showing what you did. It's not a video, so, that, so, so someone who is using it can, can like stay 30 minutes in the same place thinking about what he did next. Because it's not a video, so it won't take up that much disk space. So just a few tips to get cute, good error descriptions. Then we're going for logon diagnostics. You have to learn how to troubleshoot the stuff that's happening on the computer before you log on. I'm trying to have like a timeline to this, so we'll start with stuff that's happening in the OS before anyone logs on. There's two ways of getting info. First of all, our logs, and the other way is, other way is interactive logon diagnostics which is something that it's not built into, but you have to cheat the operating system to be able to do it. There's a few user accounts that are always locked onto the computer even though no programs are running, called system, local service, and network service. One that you can use and actually has power to do troubleshooting is system, so we'll use that, and we will talk about it a bit more later on. What we'll have to do is use a really, really cool thing called the image file execution options. This is actually a point of the demonstration that I always, I'm always a bit scared that will Microsoft ever, ever let me come back here? Because they really don't like this. There's a 
file called, uh, there's a registry key called the image file execution options, which is originally built for debugging of, uh, debugging tool for people at product support services. If you think about it, when you, when you start up Notepad in Windows, what happens? You can use Process Monitor to figure out that it does uh, path checking. It goes through all the paths where it might have Notepad and then shoots it up. But there's actually something that is a lot more powerful than any path variables. So software, policies, Microsoft, Windows, and up, 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 that's, sorry, wrong one. That's uh, software, Microsoft. Windows NT, current version, image file execution options here. There's lots of stuff that's not exactly running as you think they are. If you go here, and on my computer, if I'll shoot up Notepad, we get Notepad. But if I'll do this, new key, notepad.exe, oh, sorry, notepad.exe, we'll actually run a debugger called calculator. You won't use this to fool around with your friends. <laughs> what I'll do now is uh, go for a notepad from the run. You get calculator. <laughs> if you go to computer, Windows, wouldn't it be cool that every single user had to go here and cli right click on it and choose open to actually get the notepad. No, they won't. <laughs> so let's think about this a little bit more. Uh, notepad XE, let's change Notepad XE. If I, if I press Windows P, what happens? Second screen. You know, Windows P. So if I'll change this to Display switch.exe, then Windows P will do a calculator. If I change that calculator to cmd.exe, Windows P will do command prompt. <coughs> Windows P might be something that's usable even before anyone has logged on, you think, if you have tried it. But let's make it a bit more interesting, and it's, as this can be used to crack your windows as well. I won't do it, but some people do. Let's change this to setHC.exe, because this is the coolest way to crack into Windows 8.1 or Windows Server 2012 R2 domain controllers, by the way. If I lock out or sign out, even better, when I can't remember my user ID or when I can't remember my password, I can brute force into it by hitting the shift key as hard as I can, as quickly as I can. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> Who am I? Oh, Mr. System, that's even better. So net user, cool. Net user, hacker. Oh, sorry, wrong keyboard. There we go, net local group administrators. In Finnish, I wouldn't be able to do this. <laughs> hacker, add, and there you go. Just log on with the hacker. I got my, well, yeah, I could log on. The only thing is well, it won't show up here, so you would have to reboot the machine to get the hacker shown here, but trust me, it'll work. Oh, sorry, that's even the wrong ID. That's not the one I was going to use. But if we're not talking about cracking the computer, still, why I showed you this was because that, that's what makes you able to do debugging in the logon screen. Before anyone has logged on or during someone is logging on. You press Shift for five times, you can do whatever. Check, ping the computer to check if it, if it has, if you can download group policies, Run process monitor to see what's happening during the logon. Whatever you wish. With full rights. Don't start explorer.exe or IE Explorer. That's scary, running IE with system rights. 
Yo, Hacker is here. Good. If you need to get some more info on the logon, one of the cool tools that SysInternals has is our auto runs. Probably seen it at least sometimes. Um, nowadays, if I get my hands on a computer at my company that has had some malware to it, they don't have admin rights, but they can still inject malware into their own profile. So what I usually do is I log on with my own credentials to the computer or the local admin credentials to the computer. And then what I'll do is I'll take the auto runs tool from here, and I'll actually run it with um, shift key right click and run as different user. And then I'll give this to the user and ask him or her to use his own credentials to log on. What you will get is you will get the auto runs what would happen if he or she logged on. So you can take the malware part off before he logs on. I actually learned that only like a year ago. That's been very useful. If you really want to go deeper, there are other sessions in TechEd which do this part, so I won't have it on this one, although I'm not even quite sure if you have it here, but at least you can check it at the uh, Channel 9 from both Europe and US. But um, this is an actual screenshot of, from a customer that I did. I do lots of uh, slow logon troubleshooting. That's really common nowadays. So on the left-hand side, there's a timeline of a Windows logon taking 400 seconds. It's quite long. And after debugging and taking out a single group policy preference item, which was causing all of this, we got down to a little bit, little, little bit under 200 seconds. So 50% savings times 3,500 computers that they had. It's actually a really good gig for a consultant because it's, you, it's, it's easy to get the money out of it because you can just count how much they save by doing it. Background services. Now we got some tools to do troubleshooting before someone logs on, but what if we're doing troubleshooting for stuff that has already logged on but we can't see it, meaning services. Services are something that uh, doesn't have a user interface usually and it's running in the background. Uh, basics, it's a security issue or something else. If your service is not running or working as expected, there are two cases, security, which is about half of it, doing something to do with the service not having rights, for example, to log on as a service, for example. And the other part is about 50%. That's something that we diagnose with process monitor to figure out what the service is doing. First of all, what you need to do is figure out the PID. So you do a SC query X or use PowerShell. PowerShell is something that I should be learning a lot. I have now already three books next to my bed, which I should be reading. I just get more and more books there. I should, be, I should do this with PowerShell, because I know it's possible with PowerShell also. I used to call it lower hell, but uh, I've gotten through that phase. But what you can do after that is just use process monitor and filter it out. So use a process monitor filter, PID is and inject the value that you got from the SC command. So you can see what the thing is doing. Uh, David Solomon used to say that if something is broken in Windows, run process monitor when he started his courses. It's like a basic rule. Something is not working, run process monitor. It's good for everything. If you are trying to figure out what a service can or cannot do, you have to become a service. I used to have a friend of me friend of mine teach, teaching network protocols and stuff like that. And he was always talking about DNS. And I said to him that the best thing about you talking about DNS is that you refer to DNS servers as he. And I'm starting to think that you should do the same with services. Whenever you start thinking about talking about he or she, you're getting there. They're your normal user accounts. They have profiles just as normal users have profiles. They have desktops. They are saving stuff on their desktop, although they shouldn't be, as some of us might be. 
There are three different service accounts that you can use. There are two that we refer to as HE, called network service and local service. Local service belongs to the normal limited user account, uh, no, normal limited users group, doesn't have any rights on the local computer, any admin rights, and goes to the network without any user ID or password. Then there's network service, belongs to the local users group as local service, but when talking to the network uses a computer account from Active Directory if you are domain joined. If you are not domain joined, it tries to use its computer account and its password, but they are not, they are, they actually don't exist as such. And then there's the one that we refer to as she, which is system, and system can do anything. It can do whatever it wants. She can do whatever she wants. And when talking outside of the computer, it's exactly like network service. So if you would want to give user, if, if you would like to give a service access to a file folder in a server, you would give the access to the computer account. If you're playing around with group policies, this might be something that you know very well. And also the coolest thing is that service have SIDs. Windows security principles, the basics of Windows security. Every user has an access token. As a service has an access token as it's running with the user account. And the access token is something that has the user's SID in it, the group SIDs that he belongs to, and his user rights. And now services have SIDs, and Windows security states that a, an entity that has a SID becomes a security principle that can have user rights assigned to it. You can even assign file and folder rights to services. You used to be able, in Windows XP, for example, you had to give the services to system, local service, or network service. So you only had three options. Now every service has a SID. Let's see. Here we go. First of all, access token. <laughs> Sorry. That's just, just there to keep me happy. Who am I slash all? Uh, who am I slash all says that uh, my SID is actually this one. SID is built up from a domain or local computer SID, and everything after the last dash is a read, relative identifier, which identifies the user in the domain or the user in the computer. And then the rights that you have and the groups that you belong to. SC query is something that you can use to. Sorry, SC show SID is something that you can use to show SIDs from services. What could I do with this info? I could, um, for example, give user rights to program files, Windows, whatever, security, edit, add, and you have to type NT service. Spooler, so now you have Mr. Spooler and his user rights. Okay, you just have to be careful with this because SC shows it. If you've seen this service in Windows OS called Secret Echelon, that should make you a bit scared. But nowadays, you know that NSA is doing this anyway, so it doesn't have to be a secret anymore. Um, that's not actually the secret echelon service, as the most important service in Windows OS is, why doesn't Mr. Laiho give us a break, which also has a SID? So it actually is counting the SID from the letters that you write. It's, it doesn't have an actual SID, but the SID is always same on every single computer, depending on the letters that you use and the characters that you use. So the string itself is used to create the SID.
But the most important thing, you cannot do any real troubleshooting with an admin account. I really do hope that most of you know this by now, as it's been the case, especially since NT4. Mr. Administrator is, all, all, is many times referred to as the guy who can do anything, but he can't do actually, he can do about half of it. But he's a really, really lousy user ID if you compare it to like Unix or Linux root user. Root actually can do whatever he wants, but in Windows Administrator, even the built-in one that can't do, I can't say the word. What's good about system? He can do stuff that admins can't. He doesn't need to worry about policies. That's even better. If you have a policy that states that you can only run IE, or you can only run Firefox, and make a web kiosk, system can run whatever he wants. Sorry, she wants. I'm trying to learn. I just got married two years ago, so. Uh, she can do whatever she wants. She can run whatever, even if you have app locker policies saying that you are not allowed to run the software system can. I used to have a test laboratory at home. I used to have a life also <laughs> before the test laboratory. I've gotten rid of it now. I, I actually did have an Active Directory domain at home, and I had organizational units called the living room, office, and bedroom. And I was trying to manage my home with an Active Directory domain. Then I, did a, I tried to watch a TV show, and it took me seven and a half hours to get the TV on because I had to do Active Directory disaster recovery to get TV on, and th then a guy showed me a box, called it a TiVo, <laughs> just press the button and you get a picture, <laughs> amazing. So I got rid of all that. But at that time I had a computer in my living room, which I only allowed to be used for browsing the web and playing songs on Winamp. And, some, and one day I came there, I used it as a test laboratory. I took a huge case of beer, gave it to my friends, and they will always crack it up. Whatever I tried to prevent them from doing, they would do it. So I just give them beer. It's in like an easy and cheap testing laboratory. So they were hacking it up, and suddenly they were running whatever they wanted. And I asked them, what did you do to get that running? Why are you running iTunes, although Winamp is the only one permitted? How can you do it? And they said, it's easy because we just schedule it. Because Task Scheduler uses the system account. So if you schedule something, it's allowed. Because system doesn't have to obey policies. They can stop processes administrators can't. And the last one is the coolest of them all, although the most unknown part of this, which is that it has a higher integrity level we are going to have a raise of hands. First, everyone raise their hands who are not going to raise their hands. OK. Uh, how many of you know what mandatory integrity control is? Few. It's been there since Vista. If you remember someone telling that IE protected mode was more secure on Vista than on XP, that's because of this. If you've ever seen. Someone ask, whoa. Which mandatory mode did you say? Sorry? Sorry? Mandatory what mode? Mandatory integrity control. You'll see it in writing, so it's easier for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about my language, not you. <laughs> Let's see here. Um, so first of all, perhaps you've seen this. Someone asked why a user profile has application data which is divided into three folders. It's easy to figure out why it's local or why it's roaming, because that's due to roaming profiles. But what's the difference between local and local low? That's the integrity level. This is a huge security barrier in Windows Vista and up although yet no one seems to be talking about it at all. What am I talking about? What I'm talking about is that every process in Windows actually has an integrity level, a mandatory integrity level. 
a user has a mandatory integrity level, which is then given to all the programs that he is using. Your user is running medium by default. Uh, if you use UAC to uh, use the run as administrator to pump up your user rights, then you are running high. That's the highest that an admin can get. If you're running unsecure software, like IE, should I be saying this on video? Uh, <clears throat> if you're running a, <laughs> I should remember to say web browser, I'm sorry. I actually saw a few guys from Microsoft talking about uh, when they're having their session, you have to remember always to say that people should Google with Bing. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, how can, how can you compete with that if the other guy owns the verb? It's like, <laughs> Google with me. <laughs> well, to get back to the topic. So if you are running an insecure software like web browser, email, application, or something like that, they are usually run with the integrity level of low. Basics are that as every process has an integrity level, every resource has an integrity level as well. So files, registry hives, they have integrity levels as well. If you are running the same level of integrity on your program, you can write to the same level of integrity resource. But if the resource has a higher integrity level than your software, then you can't write to it. So in Windows 7 and Windows 8, you might end up in a situation where you're trying to write to a file, and even though you have, you have full control rights to it, or you try to make it like everyone full control, take ownership, everything, and you still can't write to it, then you should remember this stuff. Because then you have to lower the integrity level of the file. That's in building always, you can do it with iCackles. If you're thinking, if you've been wondering why iCackles is iCackles, it's not iCackles because iPad is iPad. And, stuff like that. It's iCackles because the I stands for integrity. It's the only software that can do integrity levels. How can you run as a system? There's a few ways to do it. There's one Microsoft way that you might see in System Center Configuration Manager or Microsoft Deployment Toolkit, which is using a free exe on the MDT toolkit called the service UI.exe that can get through a service isolation barrier that Windows has built to it, has, has had built into it since Vista. Since Vista, services have been staying in, a, in its own session called the session zero. And if you ask someone from session zero to show you something, it won't be able to do it. You can go fast with this, or then just take an external software, and this one you should know. It's an old one, PSXEC from System Journal's tools. So BSXX SID doesn't have anything to do with SIDs as security identifiers, but it's the same as dash S dash I dash D. System, interactive, don't wait are the three parameters. So let's go here. First of all, this is an administrator account. Who am I? Slash all. He has rights. He belongs to groups, and here is a way to see his ident uh, integrity level. If you want to see a user's integrity level, you use who am I slash all, because it says it here, mandatory label, high mandatory level. Only one who can get up to system is Mr. System, sorry, Mrs. System. And uh, she can actually stop whatever or destroy whatever in the OS. So it's important to get that account. For example, System volume information, access is denied. Let's go regedit it and see what's in our security account manager database. It's empty, as is security. When we do the same with Mrs. System, psxec sid cmd, let's see. System volume information, here we go. Let's do regedit. it. HK local machine, SAM, security, policy, secrets, whatever. So it's an easy way to see the difference between a 
build an admin and system. Build an admin can see half of the stuff, what's happening. So if you do real troubleshooting, first you have to get the system account. Because you won't have policies preventing you from doing stuff and you can see everything. So you can actually do debugging. When you're doing when you are doing troubleshooting, the, one of the biggest things that people seem to be missing is that they think that processes can do something. I have this, I have a, I have a troubleshooting hands-on, takes usually three to five days on the second morning, usually I start with this, and I won't do it on the Monday evening if people are tired, I told, tell them that just go home early and we'll start with this in the morning because this is the thing that on the course that is most important to you. And we use about two hours to talk about processes and threads. But now we don't have that much time, but we'll go just through the basics. So first of all, as the topic is called black belt, I usually talk about having troubleshooters with different values, like different belt colors. You have the guys at home, just the end user, grandma, paying her uh, invoices or pay, pay, using net banking or stuff like that, doesn't have to know anything. And then you have the yellow belt guys. Those are the guys that come and help when something goes wrong. For example, explorer.exe is hanging. They know that they don't have to shut down the machine, but they can just go and kill the process. When I have them on the courses, I usually tell them that I'm willing to bet you 100 bucks that in, Vista, in Windows Vista, Explorer XE, XE never hanged. And people start laughing, because you know that in Vista, Explorer XE was hanging all the time. But actually it wasn't, because it's not the Explorer XE that is hanging. Because Explorer XE, as a process, can't do anything. It's only a silo of resources given to different threads. You have the guys who use this, let's go here, task manager. In Windows 8, this one is the end user version, which I like nowadays. It doesn't even show the folders as Windows Explorer. I think it's good that they've divided it like this one for the end user, and if you need to know stuff, then more details. I like it. But if you go here, even this one, I could use, we, we've only got 75 minutes, and I'll tell you now that 75 minutes is not close enough time to tell you what's wrong with Task Manager. You'll need as, at least like 180 minutes just to go through all the flaws that, uh, flaws that Task Manager has. In Windows 7 Task Manager, uh, if you have a value of 0 0.9, it says 0 in the UI. It counts it to 0, not 1. At, at least in Finland, in school, 0 0.9 is closer to one than zero. So you might have 100 processes taking up 0.9% of resources and still task manager would say everything is okay. That's lousy. It's gotten better now, but still it has lots of flaws into it. And the most important thing is that if this one shows you that you actually have Explorer XE here and it is doing something, it actually isn't doing anything. Because Explorer X is a process, and processes don't do anything. So if you have yellow belt troubleshooters, that's where they're stuck at. That's also why they can't, any, can't find any answers to their questions, because there's so much noise on the internet. Google is a very... <laughs> the search engine of your choice. Oh my God, this is hard. Um, I'll still, I'll, let's use IE. Uh, uh, no, uh, e. can I actually do this with me? <laughs> let's try. <laughs> Every trainer knows never change your script. Just did it. If you are trying to find something like Explorer XE is Hanging. I'll bet you the answer is here. 
Many people think that the answer might not be here, but I, I actually think it is here. I'm sure someone else has had the trouble that you are having. It's the noise that makes it unusable. It's, it's the same with Google. What if we'll see what's actually happening? Let's change here. Use the system account, although you could do this with an admin account as well. Let's do Process Explorer. No, Process Explorer. And see what's happening. So if you go here, explorer.exe, and right click properties and go to threads, you will see the actual threads that are doing something. There's actually quite a lot of software running under Explorer. So if you would check this, for example, a shellwappy.dll or shcore.dll, and in, even in Vista, if you would go and check it out, it was one of those that was hanging. So if you change from Explorer XE is hanging to Shell Wappy, DLL is hanging. 84,800 goes down to 6,000. We are not there yet, but that thing that I'm trying to go to here is get to here is that you can take most of the noise out of the picture because you are, you are talking to people who know more of Windows OS, there's less of them, they, you get more exact results without the noise. Just remember, you can't do anything with processes. You need at least one thread. If you check out notepad.exe, it has a single thread. It's not doing multi-threading, but it still has a thread. Oh, sorry. Let's go back to the slides. Still got 15 minutes. Good. That was the demo. Safe mode. In Windows 8, it's a bit tricky to get to safe mode. Probably seen it if you have a slate, like I have a Windows RT here. If I try to use this to go into safe mode, I'll boot the machine and oh, don't know what to do. There's no keyboard. So they had to come up with a different way of getting to safe mode if you don't have a keyboard. And at the same time, they did a favor for us all because USB keyboard driver is the slowest driver in the whole OS, easily. So they took out the whole USB keyboard driver. That's why even if you have a keyboard, when you go to safe mode, you are doing it a bit differently in Windows 8 than in Windows 7. Actually, when you, if you have a Windows 8 machine, now I'll have to remember to do, is do this on the VM. It's the last time I did it on the presentation computer. Uh, let's go here, start, settings, change PC settings, uh, general, and right at the bottom there's advanced startup. You press this one, restart now. What actually happens is that it reboots the computer into Windows RE, Windows Recovery Environment. Other way of doing the same thing is easier, which is Use the settings, power, and shift button, and restart. That's the same. Let's actually restart this. It will restart in uh, Windows RE mode first. A small piece of software which is actually used to say that during the next reboot of this machine, I would like, like it to go into safe mode. So you don't have to press the F8. If your computer is not booting up correctly, then it will always go to the Windows RE by default, and you can do it from there. Same thing, but it'll reboot it to the safe mode. So you still might need an external way of doing this, because if your BCD store, for example, is corrupted, you won't be able to do this. So let's say restart. But the funniest thing about the safe mode is that if you check out Microsoft's instructions on creating software, they say that you should do software which is installed with MSI, Windows Installer. The preferred way to install software is with an MSI, because it's easy to use it in SCCM, group policy, installations, whatever. Use MSI. What if you check out Knowledge Base and 
try to figure out what to do if after, an, after, an software, after a software installation, your computer is hanging. What it says? It says, go to safe mode and remove the software. OK, we'll do that. It's nice that they say it on their website. I hope they will correct it after they hear these sessions. But um, actually, the other question about safe mode is, of course, if it is working in safe mode, but not in the normal mode, what's the difference? We can combine these two. And safe mode is luckily controlled, controlled in the registry. You can tweak the safe mode as much as you wish, although it's not allowed. Uh, what I mean by not being allowed is that uh, Windows doesn't, uh, Microsoft doesn't recommend changing safe mode. Well, why did I, how did I learn this? No one taught me this. I learned this by myself. It was because of a malware called the Symantec antivirus, if you've heard of it. <laughs> it's, um, it, it, it goes to your computer and it pretends to be securing your computer, but there's exactly no way of getting rid of it. You can try whatever and you won't get rid of it. If you go to their website, you will find the instructions. It's about 20 page long document what to remove from the registry and what to remove from the file system, etc., to get it out of there. So I was a semantic trainer myself. And I needed a way to teach people how to get rid of semantic antivirus from a computer. So that's how I figured this one out. Let's start with the registry as that the other one is booting. If we go here, local machine, uh, sorry, system, current, control set, control, and safe boot. It has two keys under it. The other one is the normal safe mode, and the other one is safe mode with networking. And it has a list of device drivers and services that can be run in a safe mode. So if you need to figure out why something is working in the normal mode, but not in the safe mode, at least you have a list of what is there. You have the same list for a working computer in here, current control set services. That's the same list for a working computer. Mm. So here, safe boot minimal. This is actually starting to look like a demo effect. OK, luckily it's not that bad. It was only sometimes happens with the full screen on Hyper-V. So let's go here and choose enable safe mode, number four, and let the computer restart. So, <coughs> how oh, we have a mouse? Yay. Let's try this out with Adobe Reader. So, here we have software that we would like to get rid of. Uh, let's go for add remove programs. And let's say Adobe Reader is doing something bad for the computer, so we don't want to get rid of it. So let's go uninstall. Yes, please. And Windows install a service. It's not running in safe mode. You are absolutely, there's no way of getting rid of any MSIs. So that's kind of a weird instruction of telling you to use MSI for every installation. And if you have an unresponsive computer get rid of the software in safe mode, although you can't get rid of anything MSI. Isn't that like so cool that every single home user, a normal home user, should know how to go to services and find Windows installer service right click and first start it before removing? Ah, no, even not that one is working because it's not allowed in safe mode. So now we'll do the same thing we did on the base machine here. So let's go to regedit. System, current control set control, safe boot. 
mm, minimal and create a new key here to the list. Up, mm, oh, sorry. New key, which is the service name, MSI server. And its default value needs to tell if it's a service or a driver. So it's a service. Windows installer, start, get started. Adobe Reader gets uninstalled. That's cool. So safe mode is a good tool if you know what it does and you know how to tweak it. There's also a few ways of making these semi-safe modes. Uh, there's a MS config tool, system configuration, which I use a lot. If I go to an comp unresponsive computer, I try to reboot it. If I get into safe mode, I'll go to MS config, check it out, and use this hide all Microsoft services. Because believe it or not, Windows usually works if it only has the Windows services. So you can you know the external ones right away. MS config and auto runs. Auto runs does the same thing, but also with uh, in, with, also with visible programs, not only services. So that was the demo already. I've done that so many times now. What's new with the uh, blue screen of death, BSOD? You have to first of all remember that BSOD is not hanging, actually, because BSOD is something that the OS itself does. It's the last resort. If something happens in the kernel mode, for example, two processes start to use, uh, try to use the same memory address, for example, there's risk of data corruption, so it'll do blue screen. Just to, uh, let's say, if, if, you really, if you actually have a crash that would be closer to a situation that your mouse is hung, won't do anything, keyboard is not working, you have a picture on the computer, you can't do anything. There's no way of getting a memory dump out of that one. But if, you're, if you get a blue screen, the best thing is that you always get a memory dump. We're not going to go through this a lot on this session because, as I said, there have been other sessions that have the same topic, so I'll let them have this. Um, main big differences between Windows 7 and Windows 8 is, for, if it is, of course, the look of the blue screen. It's only a smiley. Oh, I'm so sorry, something went wrong. Um, it's not as offensive as the old one. Actually, there's technical stuff behind it which are cool. First of all, there used to be a register value like this, and the problem with not modern computers is that if you had two gigs or more of RAM, the only way to do a complete memory dump was through this register value. Now they got it back. In Windows 8, you can do a complete memory dump even if you have more than two gigs of memory. And actually, the default value is an automatic memory dump. Automatic memory dump works so that it usually does a memory dump from the kernel only, as kernel usually makes, makes computers blue screen. It does a kernel memory dump. And if it's blue screened, like on Monday, then for the next two weeks, it'll create a bigger page file just to be able to do a complete memory dump if needed. Because when a, I don't know how much you know about blue screens, but if, blue, if a blue screen happens, the first thing is that when the computer is bug checked, as they say, uh, it'll dump the memory to a file, but it can't take the chance of creating a new handle. It needs to have an al already open file. And the only big open file that's, already, uh, that's always opened is the page file. So it'll flush the memory that it has into the page file. And then on next reboot, it'll rename the page file.sys to memory.dmp and make a memory dump. So the page file needs to be big enough to fit in the memory dump. So the stupidest, the most stupid thing that you can do on a Windows is look at the internet and take the instructions that say that you can make your computer a lot more efficient by taking the page file out or moving it on D instead of C. Because if you move it from C to D, it can't do the 
memory dump. You always have to have a page file as big as your memory on C if you're thinking it, about it like troubleshooting-wise. And you can put it on D, because then people think that if I have it on C and on D, then it will it'll use the slow C first and then start using the D. No Windows NT 4.0 was the first OS that was built so that if it has a page file on the other disk, it will always prefer that first to make it more efficient. But when a blue screen happens, it has it on the C. Everything's fine. Automatic memory dump. So kernel mode dump, the default. If your computer has crashed for two weeks, it'll keep a bigger page file. Just if you have to do a complete memory dump at that time, it can do it. And after two weeks, it'll just get the page file back a bit smaller, to a bit smaller value. You also have to be able to crash when needed. That's one of the most important things about a computer where you're doing hardcore troubleshooting on it. You have to be able to blue screen when you want. If you have a computer that's un unresponsive, you need to be able to make, get, make it to do the memory dump instead of just standing there without giving any information. You might talk to product support services and they might tell you that please do a complete memory dump and then you have to know how to do it. They actually fixed this one because it used, uh, just about half a year ago, it used to work so that, uh, no, sorry, about two years ago, it didn't work with USB keyboards, only with PS2, but now they fixed it. Now it works also on USB keyboards, which you don't have on slates, I know, <laughs> but you should still do this. Because you can always get an external keyboard on a slate and bug check it. So it, what it basically happens if you put, uh, use the registry value that you can find here, and then you would press control, uh, that's control, scroll, lock, scroll. <laughs> you shouldn't do that on a presentation. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, So, basics of a PSOD. You need symbols. You need simple files to translate stuff on the OS, because the OS is not open source. Microsoft has two different symbols. They have symbols for external use, and they have symbols for internal use. So even if you download the symbols for your Windows, you will see names of functions that Microsoft wants you to see, not the actual ones, because only internal folks get the ones which have the actual values. But for troubleshooting, that's good enough because all the other people who are troubleshooting use the same symbols, so you get help. And then the easiest way to get those symbols nowadays is through internet, so you can download them. You do a computer, pay, computer, vali computer variable, not a user variable, con uh, computer variable, underscore nt underscore symbol underscore path, and tell them the local folder, which is SRV, that will be C drive SRV subfolder. Uh, sorry, C symbols is the subfolder, actually. Uh, and then there's the HTTP value of where to get the symbols from. And then you can, if you have a crash, then you can use WinDPG to analyze it. It'll just tell you probably caused by. This will just take you a few minutes to do. Or you, if you have uh, MDOP, then you can use uh, DART, a few acronyms here. <laughs> if you have MDOP, you can use DART, which has a crash analysis tool, which does exactly the same thing. You just give, give it the symbols, and you have a few buttons less to push to get the same info. OK, I still have 19 seconds to go. Um, this is actually my first time in Australia. And I would really like to get back here. So if I am to get back here, I need evaluations. So I hope you will please go after. There should, should be about 30 minutes. And after that, you can go and fill in the evaluation. And after I'm done, I'm going to stay here. I got about 20 t-shirts, so you can try your best if you want them or if you want to ask questions. We've got lunch, so I'm going to stay here anyway. But with that, I would like to thank you.